Hey everybody, this is Walter with Access Electric and I'm here again with Bobby Carrillo of Rexel USA. Hello. And uh, today, this is part two of a three-part series and today we're gonna be talking about the basics of VFD operation. So hang with us as uh, Bobby takes us through what those basics are. All right, here we go. So how does the VFD actually work? How does it control the speed of your motor? Well, first of all, what does the VFD even stand for? It's a variable frequency drive and it's an AC drive technology that changes speed while maintaining torque in an AC induction motor by changing the frequency and the volts together. Uh, in the previous video, we had talked about maintaining the volt hertz ratio. The VFD actually does that. It's been called other names. It has uh, lots of ways that it's described, an inverter drive, um, an AFD, VVF, but it's not the same as an ASD or VSD. Those are different. So VFDs are commonly called, that's what they're commonly called. Um, <laughs> so the VFD changes the voltage and the frequency together to maintain torque while changing speed, maintains the volt hertz ratio, Many technologies do this. Uh, t tell me, Bobby, just so in case somebody doesn't know, what, what would be the benefit of maintaining torque while changing speed? Um, because most machines require torque rather than just horsepower. So you can slow down the motor but still drive the machine that you're trying to drive. So can you give me an example of what a high torque load would be? A conveyor that's overloaded with... Um, a lot of wine bottles. Okay, um, so it like takes a, a lot of winery. initial torque to get it started. Correct. Yeah, so the, the conveyor is fully loaded and you want it to run, so you have to eat all that full torque no matter what speed you started at. Okay, and, so, a, and a VFD will give us constant torque. No matter the speed. Because it's keeping the ratio of voltage to frequency set at a certain ratio. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So you always, you never lose the torque no matter how fast you run it. Okay. Thank okay, you. no problem. So many technologies do this. You got PWM, which is the pulse with modulation, six steps, um, the LCI, load commutated inverter, cyclo converter, et cetera, et cetera. But the winner in low voltage drives, which is what we're talking about primarily, which is 40 volts and, and lower, is pulse width modulation. Um, we're gonna get into that, exactly what that is uh, later on, but that is definitely how the um, drives of this size handle uh, changing speed yeah. while maintaining torque. That's the magic of a VFD. That's it right there. Pulse width modulation. So, um, and it's accomplished via conversion, rectification, and inversion using advanced power electronics that are all inside the VFD. And it uses the source as only as a raw material and makes DC from it, then recreates AC from the DC. And the next few slides are going to show you exactly how that's done. Okay, so the three main power sections of a VFD you have the rectifier, the DC bus, and the inverter. Um, AC power comes in on one side, goes through the VFD, and comes out to the motor on the other side. So what actually happens in these three sections is the rectifier takes uh, the AC and converts it to pulsating DC. Okay. Um, that happens in the first stage. So in the DC bus, the pulsating DC is smoothed out by transistors inside that section of the DC bus and then the power goes to the inverter okay um, so then the transistors invert the DC into a pseudo AC um, and we'll see that on the next slide how it looks <clears throat> so the inverter section is where the magic that is pulse width modulation happens high-speed transistors fire DC pulses of varying width into the motor the AC motor is an inductive circuit, and the phenomenon, the phenomenon called the inductive time constant acts to slow down the response and the change in DC voltage of the pulses. And pulse width modulation output makes the motor act as if it's getting AC power. And here's a really good representation of exactly what happens. These DC pulses that are created, even with the gaps, it still looks like half of a sine wave. Um, and AC works with a full sine wave, of course. So here is the AC RMS voltage that shows you the top half of the sine wave. And then in the next stage, after it's smoothed out, you can see the inverter that inverts it down to the negative side of the sine wave. So here is a really good representation of the pulses um, creating the pseudo AC that the motor requires. So these pulses happen very quickly and as you speed up or slow down the VFD, it changes the rate of the sine wave. 
and that's how you are able to vary the frequency and speed of the motor. So as the sine wave goes down, you're running slower. As you speed it up, the sine wave runs faster and the motor speeds up. So switching the switching of the transistors is done at a very, very high rate. Yeah, if each cycle, if you're running 60 hertz a second or 60 cycles a second, that it, I don't know how many times it pulses mm -hmm. for each half of a cycle, mm -hmm. but that would, that's a lot of pulsing. That's, that's uh, very, very fast. Exactly. Yeah. And as we see here with this micro, with this uh, microscope, you can see how many pulses are happening in each uh, part of the pseudo sine wave. Okay. And as you see these pulses there, there are actually a series of short pulses. The ones we talked about how, how fast it's happening and the uh, one kilohertz to 16 kilohertz is a typical range of adjustment. Uh, it's lower on the larger drives. Mm. There's your carrier frequency there inside the, the microscope. Okay, so sometimes when you run a motor, you can hear a whine and that's caused by the carrier frequency. Okay. And the carrier frequency is caused by vibrations in the motor windings and the laminations as the current uh, changes states rapidly within these pulses. The higher the carrier frequency, the higher the pitch. So adjusting the carrier frequency above uh, 10 kilohertz, it moves out of it moves it out of human hearing, so you can't really hear it anymore. So that's why it goes away. Hmm. The higher carry frequency also equals greater switching losses, um, small amounts of resistance to change the current flow inside of the transistors. Uh, more switching operations equals more losses equals heat, which is equals less efficiency in the drive. So you don't want to go too high on the carrier frequency. The drives control that. It should be kept as low as possible, bearable. Um, better for the VFD, better for the motor. As we'll learn later, uh, the less heat, the better. Just right. always for, for VFDs and motors. Heat is the number one killer of VFDs, definitely. Okay. Pulse spin modulation can be further broken down into four types of control alg algorithms that allow for varying degrees of performance, which we'll talk about now. Um, the first one is scalar control, which is basic volts hertz control. The second is sensorless vector control, the flux vector control, and the field-oriented control. And we're going to go through each of these uh, in more detail now. So overview of scalar control versus vector control. Scalar control puts the correct pulse width modulation volt hertz pattern out to the motor. No idea if the motor responded correctly or not to a change in the load. So basically it has no feedback. Um, there's no way of knowing that what you're sending out to the motor, if it's being received or if the motor's reacting the way it should. Hmm. Um, there's no feedback at all. It's like singing with earplugs in. You can sing and you know you're making noise, but you can't really hear it. Vector control uses a feedback loop of some sort from the motor. This is where we actually get feedback to see um, if the uh, control for the motor is effective. It creates a mathematical motor model based on testing and it monitors the motor performance for errors in response to the change in load. This be like a, a speed reference of some kind back from the motor? Correct, uh, some kind of um, tachometer or something that, that says. So it's basically like a PID loop that keeps the motor at a current, it knows how to change the pulse width, pulse width modulation in order to keep the motor to, at the current speed. Exactly, okay. it's perfect. And it corrects the error by breaking the pulse width modulation pattern to adjust for the vectors of flux. And just like you said, if something happens, it, it makes, gives the VFD time to change and adjust. So the type of vector control uh, relates to how the feedback loop is done. Scalar control is VFD just puts out minimum necessary pulse width modulation pattern that meets the motor's needs, but there's no feedback loop. It's not well suited for high dynamic response applications of torque control. It's, it's really the basic type of control for any motor. And it's good for speed ranges of up to six to one. These numbers here, you'll see them change for each one of the controls. You'll get more and more precise as we talk about the other three types of control for these. Mm. So this type of control is necessary for multiple motor applications with one VFD. Um, it is possible to run multiple motors off of one VFD as long as the cumulative uh, full load amps of the motors don't exceed the rating of the VFD. Mm. Yeah, so somewhere we would see that uh, would be in say a refrigeration evaporative cooler where you have several evaporative cooler fans mm -hmm. but they're all driven maybe by one VFD and they all come out at the same time. Yes 
And they don't have to have the speed changed individually. They right. can They're all change all run together. The same speed. Right. Exactly. And so that's that can be pretty useful in that type of application. And it's usually fine for centrifugal loads like pumps and fans. And pumps and fans are ninety percent of what VFDs are used for anyway. So it's it's usually covered by that type of control. Hmm. Okay. So centralized vector control is everything a scalar drive can do. Plus, uh, it monitors mon motor performance. It has uh, feedback sensors inside of the VFD, and it, it gives you more velocity control and provides higher starting torque. Uh, as you can see, these numbers change for what we talked about. The 100 to 1 ratio, below 1 hertz ac accuracy can begin to drift um, and can lose motor feedback because the sensors are working off very small values. So the lower you get with the hertz, the less accuracy you're going to have on how they're actually spinning. Hmm. As you see with the next two types of control, we can get down even lower on the hertz to, and be more accurate. And it's excellent for performance of 95% of applications. These, these, that is for the first two, the sensorless vector control and the scalar control. The last 5% of applications are the last two types of control, and they're very, very not common. <laughs> hmm. They're uh, seldomly used and just very for specific applications. One of them is flux vector control, FVC. And it provides uh, level performance for high-end applications, more precisely monitors motor performance. It can be based on sensors inside of the VFD or external encoders. And it has extremely high uh, velocity control down to 0 0.05 speed regulation. And it's good for speed ranges of 120 to 1. As you can see, these numbers are just getting higher and higher with, right. with the more... Um, advanced type of control and it has very precise torque control because of the feedback we know exactly what the motor's doing and what type of torque it's, it, it has and servo life performance from AC motors with the encoder feedback for positioning uh, we, can, we can actually do that with flux vector control so the last one is field oriented control and it's peak performance for, for special applications uh, it's the same as FEC performance in most cases it adds the ability to individually separate the control motor flux and torque producing flux in the motor. Hmm. Um, it allows for the best performance of high shock load applications. Again, very specific, very special types of applications is uh, what this controls for. Um, it's the best in class speed uh, velocity control down to 0 0.001% uh, regulation. And it's up to a thousand to one speed ranges and it's the highest precision torque control hmm. um, and band positioning and it du duplicates all capabilities of the precision dc drives and motors so this is uh, again very specific applications require this so now we've talked about the four different types of of control what type do you really need hmm. um, centrifugal pumps and fans which are 60 to 70 percent of all ac motor applications Scalar is fine, SVC is slightly better, but it's hard to notice the real difference between the two. Compressors, which are 15 to 20% of all, all AC motor applications, SVC provides excellent performance because you do get some feedback from them. Simple machines and tools, cranes, heavy machinery, that's less than 10% of AC motor applications. SVC is fine for most, but that's, that's when you also want to consider FVC for a few, especially hoists. So complex machines and tools, uh, less than 1% of all applications, FOC capability may be needed, hmm. okay? Okay, so the other important components of VFDs, besides what's inside of them, you have the HIM, which is the human interface module, and this provides the user with ways of setting up the parameters inside the VFD. And then we have IO, um, all of the drives have inputs and outputs that can be used for control. Uh, you can hook up sensors to the terminal block, and if it makes a sensor, it can stop the VFD. If the sensor's clear, it can restart the VFD any way you want to wire it. You can use a little. You can use the VFD as almost like a small little PLC. Correct. You can. That's what the inputs and outputs allow you to do. And the communications module is an important part now um, because Ethernet capability um, with especially the PowerFlex drives. Uh, allow you to remotely program these drives and monitor their their output and things like that. Right, you can display their status on a HMI. Or... Correct, faults, speed, everything. Great. Anyway, I want to thank Bobby again for uh, being here and telling us about the basics of VFDs and their operation. And if you like these videos, 
click on the like button. If you want to subscribe to our channel, go ahead and click on subscribe. Uh, if you want to be notified whenever we put out another video, uh, click the bell icon. Until the next video, we'll see you later.